Hello, I'm Ella Sillywood. In today's Insight, supported by Rolex, we're taking you behind the scenes of the world's first opera in hyper-reality, Current Rising. Bringing together historic stagecraft and cutting-edge technology, audiences will be transported to a dreamlike virtual world in a multi-sensory, fully immersive experience. It'll be opera as you have never seen before. Luckily, you don't have too long to wait. It's set to open soon here in Limbury Theatre at the Royal Opera House. So, I'm going to be talking to some of the people who are helping make this unique production happen. First up, we have Annette Mace, who is head of Royal Opera House's Audience Labs, and Simon Reveley, the CEO of Figment Productions. Very excited to have you here. What a wonderful set. Thank you. Now, Simon, people have probably heard of virtual reality, but this is hyper-reality, which they might not be familiar with. So, you know, what is it? Well, hyper-reality is sort of virtual, rea virtual reality plus. So we take the standard virtual reality headset, well obviously we use the latest and greatest of those, um, and you have a backpack computer, which gives you sort of the best possible visual quality that you can get at this point in time. And then we add to that. So firstly, you have multi-users. You have, in this case, a group of four people. And uh, you also have a physical space that's dedicated to the experience. So what it means is that as you move around in virtual reality, you're physically moving around in real space. And that's actually one of the things that's really hard to do at home, because you don't get very far before you kick the cat or knock the coffee over. When you've got a dedicated space, you can have four people and you can move around freely one-to-one -one in the virtual world and the real world at the same same time. We then add to that, in some cases, smell, in some cases, um, physical effects like rumble, um, and also wind and other elements that really add to the flavour of making this feel like a real world experience. So that's what hyper reality is. I have to say, I did just see the backpacks and they look incredibly excited. When I heard hyper reality, that's what I wanted to see, <laughs> you know, a full, <laughs> a full suit. <laughs> now, Annette, you are head of the Royal Opera House's audience lab. So tell us a little bit more about those and how the Royal Opera House became involved in this. So Audience Labs is a, a relatively young department within the Royal Opera House and the department was really to set up to explore how we use new technologies like hyper-reality to make great art. Um, we make beautiful ballet, beautiful opera on our stages, but with these new technologies there's a possibility to make new work, new kinds of productions for new audiences. Um, but how do you do that well? How do you make something that speaks to your emotions, that creates something that transports you the same way that opera and ballet on our stages does? That's really what Audience Labs was set up to explore. How do we connect extraordinary artists with amazing ideas and the opportunity that technology offers? Well, speaking of incredible ideas, this is the first time your company has been involved in creating an opera, isn't it? So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, it certainly is. And it's been quite an experience because these are two um, incredibly different worlds. You know, the world of opera and the world of virtual reality, so different from each other. Um, but the thing that I think is really revolutionary and stunning about this piece is that VR has tended to be driven by the games industry. And so a lot of the experiences are very traditional game experiences. There's lots of shooting things, um, there's lots of solving puzzles, there's lots of that kind of stuff. And there's been relatively little done so far from a sort of arts and culture perspective. This is just so different from most content that anyone will experience in VR because it challenges you, you know, cerebrally in a way that most VR content just, just never will. And when you add to that the fact that it's a shared experience, which you can do with your friends or family, you know, or colleagues, and come in and do this experience with other people, you, you see that they're there with you throughout the experience, um, you know, that just, just takes it to another level. But when you work with real artists like we've been lucky enough to do on this project, it just changes the game away from having to shoot things or you know feature dinosaurs and we love dinosaurs like we've done lots of dinosaurs <laughs> but it's very very different taking something like you know the, the launch pad of Ariel from the Tempest as the starting point it makes it a very different project from the type of work we do in theme parks and, and in that kind of environment. I mean I'm a little sad to hear there are no dinosaurs involved but <laughs> <laughs> so Annette tell us about your ambitions for this project. I think um there was an opportunity that came up 
where there's a, a big program called Audiences of the Future, where across the UK, cultural institutions are working with technology to, to really look at what the future might look like. And I'd been to visit um, Figment Studios and just fell in love with the opportunity to step into a world. It felt immediately incredibly operatic. The idea that you could step into a universe that was created. Um, so we wanted to bring together a really exciting established creative team and ask them to bring all the talent but think beyond anything that been ever been made. And I think for us, that's really what we were aiming for. An experience that felt deeply operatic, emotional, but also was unlike something anyone had experienced before. Well, I think it's safe to say that has been achieved. Thank you so much, Annette and Simon. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, I am delighted to be joined by director Nisha Jones and designer Joanna Scotcher because they are going to take me on a tour of this incredible set. I can't wait. Let's head in. Now, obviously, this is the entrance to the room, isn't it? So, you know, this is what people will see first. Tell me a little bit about designing this space. The idea behind the space is that the audience are given a moment to sort of... Um, relax and calm and sort of a meditative space. It's a threshold between sort of the busy uh, outdoor Covent Garden and having a moment to sort of prepare themselves for what we hope will be a really unique and sort of one-off journey inside. So we've kept it very light and very clean and we're hoping it sort of appears as sort of quite an adventurous uh, sort of structure as you walk into the building. It's quite unusual to have something built this far out into the Limbury Auditorium. So the idea is to sort of give you a moment to sort of adjust and prepare yourself for the, for the journey ahead. I have to say, when I walked in today and saw it, it definitely, you know, there is something very striking, very challenging about it, isn't there? And then you step inside here, and, you know, this feels incredibly contemplative and calming. Yes. And, mm. Yes, very, yeah, very effective. You totally nailed it. Thanks. <laughs> All right, well, let's head through into the next room. So this is the journey the audience will actually take, isn't That's it? That's the whole idea of Current Rising. The audience are the protagonists. They're mm. inside the piece. And so the idea of coming through is you are not only coming onto the stage, which is, of course, unusual for an opera audience, but you're coming right into the story. And so all of these spaces are designed to take you through these thresholds deeper and deeper into the journey itself. I mean, this room looks incredibly exciting. I got a sneak peek of it earlier and I thought, this is exactly what I want hyper-reality to look like, isn't it? <laughs> that I come in and it's, okay, you know, a whole new world. Tell us a little bit about these, these sets and, and this room in particular, because this is kind of a practical space, isn't it, really? Yeah, I think there are both those elements. I mean, we're going on a sort of very emotional sort of journey that's driven by music, but also there's a really sort of technology sort of emphasis in, in the sort of journey you take. So obviously that entails um, kitting up. This is called the kit room. So we've gone from a very sort of calm space into a space that's sort of preparing you to sort of um, essentially kit up. So we have sort of various elements which the audience members are, are, are all sort of dressed in to go into the space and that's what creates a sort of 360 environments in the headset and we wear a backpack in this um, in this experience and that means that we're able to scan the sort of movements of the people that you're in there with at the same time and your hands in front of your face so there's there are avatars built of each of the audience members so you can essentially sort of socially distanced so you know where you are in relation to everyone in the space but also so that you have a sense of being together and later on at a certain point in the narrative you're separated and you make a, a sort of individual choice in the journey uh, within the piece so it looks very technical but as soon as you're in it sort of disappears and the idea is that you are sort of without limits and boundless and it sort of doesn't it doesn't really affect you once you're in there so it looks very technical, but the idea it's is that a, it disappears. It's the great innovation of Figment, who we're working yeah. with on this project, because quite often with VR, you're tethered, so you're attached to something or you're sitting. And here, because you're wearing mm. essentially a computer on your back, you're free to roam. And for us, this was an amazing experience because you could really explore the idea of traveling, really a proper journey through imaginary landscapes. 
Well, speaking of imaginary landscapes, this is where the journey begins, isn't it? So please, I'm raring to get inside and take a look, lead us in. Let me welcome you to the insomnia room. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, this was not what I was expecting. It's absolutely incredible, isn't it? It's so different when you've been in that kind of utilitarian space, ready to take that first step, and then you, you come into this, you are utterly transformed. It's, wow, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> breathtaking. All right, well, I guess I should probably ask you some questions because <laughs> I feel a little overwhelmed. So, I mean, why did you want to be involved in this operatic first? Well, I think for so many reasons, um, and I think that it asks each of us in our disciplines to slightly step out of our comfort zones. I, I find that quite uh, interesting when um, everyone in a room is asked to sort of bring something new that they didn't expect, and it, it sets a much bigger sort of open creative environment. So in a holistic way, it was sort of a unique experience to really exchange ideas and thoughts and sort of creative um, sort of wants for the production on a very sort of um, open platform. So that's a sort of, it's a great new way to work, but also um, in terms of sort of physical set design, um, suddenly those boundaries disappeared. And I was also invited to sort of design a set that was limitless as well. Um, so the imagination became our constraint, which was a great brief to be given at the start of the project. So I think that that's definitely why this has been very unique and appealed hugely when we were offered it. Nisha, um, for you, I mean, was it, was it a similar story, just the limitless potential? Yes, and I think um, central for me was I'm very interested in expanding the idea of what an opera can be. I think um, there really are no boundaries. You know, it, it, in, 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 as an art form, it's something that can explore myriad technologies and many different ways of presentation. Um, so that was very exciting. And then, as Joe says, the other really nice thing about working in VR is that it completely upends the traditional hierarchies. Opera is very hierarchical and actually to overturn that it became a central theme for me which is why i was so attracted to this idea of the idea of a sea change literally turning things on their head and we kind of began with that idea mm -hmm. and, and and ran with it and the other thing is that joe and i've both been very um much involved with uh, site-specific performances the idea that you take the audience on an actual journey a physical journey as well as a metaphorical journey and so that was a very good starting point for us really you know and so we worked for a long time just thinking what this journey might be and what might that mean in virtual reality well don't give it you know don't give everything away <laughs> but when you do put on that backpack when you put on the headset you know what next what happens well you're invited into this room and we call this room the insomnia room um and I think it's, a, it's another liminal space, which is a, a lovely way to describe a lot of the transitions and the moments in the piece. And we had this sort of collective response to a lot of uh, poetry and ideas of sea changes. So we were very drawn to uh, ideas and notions of that. And it, and it set a sort of tonal um, introduction to the piece, which is that sort of waking and sleeping, the, the moments between those where you start to sort of traverse your subconscious and you're processing what you're hearing in the day. Um, and we all have this sort of uh, united sort of recollection of having thoughts and, and radio passages and audio books and, and sort of music from the day or compositions we're working on all sort of floating in our subconscious. And it felt like a, a beautiful, very sort of fertile place to start the piece. So we collected sort of beautiful pieces of poetry and also um, we've got essentially shipping forecasts and various other kind of um, sort of character driven pieces of text and when you come into this room you're allowed to sort of absorb it and sort of find your place in it and once you go into the VR world we do a sort of slight theatre trick, a traditional theatre trick where we present the same world for you but obviously once we're in VR our, uh, our ability to shift and change the world gives us the opportunity to create a totally unique scene change out of this, something you could never do on stage and that sort of shift in perception is what takes you on your first step into the scene one. 
Um, and it's a very gentle and it's a very uh, calming invitation to sort of go on an, an imaginative journey in the piece. I mean, you both mentioned sea changes, and obviously, you know, this was inspired by the Tempest, in particular, the character Ariel. So why was that your starting point? Well, the Tempest is a piece that's often seen to be um, about art making itself. You know, it's very self-referential and it's about the power of the imagination. Um, W.H. Warden, in fact, describes um, the character of Ariel as the spirit of the imagination, you know, and so Ariel is a spirit, a very virtual kind of character. You know, you quite often, um, it's Ariel is androgynous, sometimes invisible, and Ariel leads the characters in The Tempest through the play. And so that was our guiding light, really, that the voices of Ariel lead the protagonists who are the participants through the journey that, that we've gone on. Um, and so it's, the, the journey happens overnight. It happens through the six phases of the night. And this was another thing that we landed on fairly early. This idea of the six phases of the night gave us the landscapes that we're in. Um, there's a civil dusk, a nautical dusk, and an astronomical dusk. So we have these three ideas of landscapes that we could go into. Um, and, and as Joe says, we fall gently into this nocturnal landscape. As we were developing this, I was actually suffering from insomnia. And my cure was to listen to international night radio. And so you are in that space between waking and sleeping where the imagination really takes over. And so that gave us our, our kind of guiding journey through the piece. I mean, I'm interested in how you made it feel so different. Of course, it's not a literal retelling of The Tempest, but it is a story that I think so many of us are familiar with. So as a designer, you know, how did you make it feel so different? I think it's the invitation uh, into a state of freedom, which is um, the real driving force behind the libretto and the composition and the design, is that we're invited to make a choice. We're given here agency to where we walk and agency to how we reflect on the questions that are being asked from us uh, within the piece. So that's, I think we took a, a much more sort of psychological journey uh, into design rather than a physical one um, and through that I think it became quite um, quite a poetic and sort of abstracted expressionistic kind of world um, to go through um, so that's sort of what guides the the design process on this one <laughs> why do you think that the tempest lends itself so well to audience interaction it's a piece that well just to start off I would say that the Liberation of Ariel was our, our starting point, mm -hmm. where we jump off from. So actually, we leave the Tempest really rather far behind. But what we were very interested in were these ideas of confinement mm -hmm. and then liberation. And the extraordinary thing is that we've been developing this project. We were just exploring it in a kind of research and development kind of a way for a long time mm -hmm. before lockdown. But then during lockdown, rather extraordinarily, the themes of our piece became very, very relevant. And this idea of isolation and connection was really a driving force for mm. us. And that's what the piece traces. It's about a figure who has been controlled or isolated or confined in some way, being released. And therefore, what are the res responsibilities of this new freedom? What will we do now, you know, in, in the Great Reset? If we are re-examining art making or everything, what does that mean for our new paradigms? And partly it's where our processes and our you know, creation completely overlapped because we were also interested mm -hmm. in exploring, as I say, these hierarchies of doing things in a different order or in a different way, doing things mm -hmm. very collaboratively. And so it's funny how everything became kind of one thing. I mean, it sounds like you know, the process of directing something like this has been very different from a traditional opera. So how have you found it? Oh, it's been absolutely brilliant. I mean, it's been completely different from anything I've ever done. And I've done some really wild, wacky things um, because I'm really interested in technology and I'm interested in how that can change our ways of working. But really, the exciting thing was this collaborative effort. You know, 
Joe and I started off we, it's a very design-led project. It has to be because you're inside an environment. Mm. And this means that actually the design, the landscapes, become our emotional journey. Melanie brought this beautiful libretto to this journey. And then Sam created this exquisite soundscape for the journey that we go on. For me, a very important link is the sound design by David Shepherd, because we are enveloped in this world. We also have, obviously, the, the opera part of it. And the sound design is like a bridge between these two things, and it helps us, I think, make an operatic experience that can also be completely immersive and completely 360 degrees. But, you know, it, it's, it's partly that, and then it was partly that working during lockdown. Um, I know that Sam has mentioned that there are some processes that we discovered through this you know, period that we'd all like to take on. Yes. And actually, the, the remote um, collaboration was fantastic. What we did is every Thursday at 11 o'clock, the full creative team would get together on a Zoom. This would never have happened in a normal kind of circumstance. Normally, I would work separately with Joe, I would work separately with Mel, I would work separately with Sam, and I would work separately with David. But what we could do was we could come together and we talked about everything. So everybody was across everything, and it made a really lovely and holistic process that I think we'll all miss. In fact, yes. we've decided just to carry on even <laughs> after the show is finished. It's something I've heard a lot, that the, the process has actually been life-changing. That You know, it, as you said, it's something you want to carry forward. Joanna, is that true for you? Absolutely. I think it's, all, it's given us all the opportunity to sort of take a look at what everyone does behind closed doors as well, in, you know, in real life, but also in terms of their sort of process. And being able to listen to shared pieces of sound design or to share sketches with a composer, I mean, those are early interactions which, if anything, have sort of lit the inspiration with the other people. Uh, rather than sort of, you know, needing to be shepherded in one direction, we've had a, a very useful sort of cross-fertilisation and as I said, because we are all working outside of our normal parameters, we've sort of created a support, a, a supportive creative like ladder to create where we're going to rather than it sort of, you know. So I think that's very unique and I think it speaks so much to what the, the piece is about. I mean, it's about sort of really connecting with people mm. and where you find meaning and, and truth in a connection and how you can sort of actualize that and, and share that in the way we would normally in a theater we've sort of invited you into our sort of subconscious and and sort of the journey that we've all taken together for the last eight months i great. mean one of the things i'm interested in is of course this is a, a piece of connection a piece of experiencing it with other mm. people but we can't ignore the fact that it is an unprecedented year i've used the word unprecedented it's happened so yes. how are you going to keep audiences safe well we have built the piece so that uh, you get four audience members and they're all invited and everyone's briefed. But what we found most important is that we have invited everyone into a very kind and open space. Everyone here is, um, from the start of your journey into the theatre itself, you are told that you'll be guided and you'll be accompanied. And if you have any questions at any point, we're here to answer them or, um, or sort of assist in any way. So we've tried to keep that in terms of access, that it's open to everyone. Um, so that shouldn't put anyone off. There is, there's nothing to be, there's nothing frightening about the idea of VR. And to make that safe, we've ensured that all the design allows for obviously social distancing at all points um, in the way in. And as I mentioned earlier, because your journey in VR, what we have created for each of the uh, participants is you have uh, what we call an avatar, which is essentially a sort of um, an imagined version of the people that you're with um, and we've kept this sort of neutral and genderless um, but what this allows for us to do is that where I can tell you're two meters from me here I can also do the same when I'm in the experience so you, the same rules that we're all applying um, to any anything we do in our day-to-day -day lives also happen in here so it's all sort of fairly straightforward um, and at any point you can be guided and taken out of the experience or guided to go into the next bit. So it, we're hoping that it'll be as welcoming as possible as well. 
Well, I have to say, just for me at least, in, in this, it has felt so welcoming. You can tell it's designed with the audience in mind. What are you hoping that they take away from this? Well, it's a brand new experience. And so what we really hope is that it is very open. So anybody, even if they've never been to an opera before, they are, you know, it, open doors here. And I hope as well that, I, you know, like me, I took a great journey into VR. I didn't know anything about it before. And as soon as I put the headset on, I wanted to go back inside. It's really, really fun. It's really exciting. And so I think um, just that really, just, you know, come and experience this very, very unusual offering. And, you know, we'd like to leave the interpretation very open so that everybody can have a completely different experience, you know, coming on this journey. Mm. And so that's what I'd hope, you know, everybody could have. Well, I absolutely can't wait. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, I'm now joined by current rising composer Sam Fernando. Thank you so much for joining me. I've got a tweet of yours written down here because it was so lovely. Back in October, you said that current rising is the most fascinating, challenging, thrilling and turn everything on its head creative process. So tell us a little bit more about that and how this is different from projects you've worked on before. Um, the main difference was there was quite a few different elements involved from the beginning. Um, and this has really uh, posed some great opportunities as well as challenges. Um, the really beautiful thing was that it was so collaborative. Um, and we had everyone involved, both you know, the writer, composer, sound designer, um, and obviously the VR company all involved um, at simultaneously putting the work together. So everything was kind of developed incrementally um, in a kind of conventional opera setup. Um, things would be perhaps a little bit more linear, although I think that's changing a lot um, now because I think performers and musicians and composers, we all like to work collaboratively and work together through the process. But this felt like it was, it was taking that to the extreme um, because we developed the, Melanie wrote this beautiful libretto um, that was developed a, a, with everybody kind of feeding into that. Um, and so I was responding to her beautiful words um, alongside responding to Joe's ideas for the visuals. Um, so I had more than one kind of point of inspiration to draw on um, for the music, which was really lovely. Um, equally, though, it was kind of challenging because you're getting um, a lot of information um, and lots of people having different ideas. And I had to take those on board and think about how I wanted to respond to those. Um, but overall, I think that actually it's been so fruitful working in this way and having this kind of sense of collaboration really from the very beginning. So what ensemble, what voice have you composed for? Um, so it's just, the, the, the work is for one soprano, um, sung um, beautifully by Anna Dennis. Um, but through the work, um, her voice gets multiplied. Um, and so we've multi-tracked her. So we start off with the single voice um, that kind of guides us through the experience. And then she divides and she becomes almost like, a, at one point, like a mob. Like there's a lot of her. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take a listen. What are we about to hear? Um, so this is a section... Um, from the, from the work where she's divided into four um, and later in the work she divides even more, so even more of her. Um, but there's four, um, her voice splits into four and we hear her across an ocean um, and her voice is also spatialised within the experience so when you've got the headphones on you will hear her voice coming, coming from different places around you. I mean, that sounds incredible. Let's, let's take a listen to soprano Anna Dennis and the Chroma Ensemble. I mean, what was it like collaborating with Anna during lockdown? Sounds like it was probably a challenge. <laughs> and it was, and it was, but actually, what, and the kind of upshot of it is that I've realised that it, there was a lot of things that we did during lockdown that I'd really like to take forward and do when we're not in lockdown. Um, 
So we were in a position where we wanted to um, create demos for the rest of the creative team because, because everything was being um, created incrementally. Um, I wanted to compose sections of music and then be able to share it with everybody else. Um, but not being able to be in the room with Anna, we were doing lots of things over Zoom. Um, and so what, what ended up happening was that I would compose a section of music and Ashley, our um, repetitor, recorded the piano reduction of that music and then he sent it to Anna and then she just used her phone to record her vocals over the top and then um, Ashley put them all together. So we had this like working demo. Um, and so that was great for sharing, so sharing with everyone else. But it was also really useful for me because I was getting to have kind of input from Anna about things early on in the process. I was getting to hear my music um, as I was going and also hear, I mean, hearing it in, through Anna's voice. So not just having to imagine it in my head or sing it myself, um, hearing how things sat with her um, and getting her input. So it was really um, useful to work that way. And I just think I'd quite like to do that for, for other pieces in the future um, because actually, you know, our phones are like such amazing technology that we have in the palm of our hands. And the, you know, the recording on there is, is perfectly ad adequate for this sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it worked really well. That's so interesting <laughs> to hear. I mean, in terms of the actual concept itself, a 3D hyper-reality mm -hmm. opera, did you find that the process was different because of that? You know, were there things that you'd like to take forward there or was that a little bit more challenging? Um, there are some really beautiful opportunities um, within working um, in this way because I think it, it addresses some of the limitations that we would normally have in a stage work it just aren't there here. So it's kind of exploiting those possibilities. So from a musical perspective, um, it means that I can have, I can create a real sense of intimacy. So I can use sounds that normally in a stage where it would just be too quiet for an audience to hear they're sitting on the back row. But if you've got headphones on, you can have somebody whispering in your ear. Um, and likewise, at the other end of the spectrum, you can create such great big climaxes that are felt through you know, the, the whole body. Um, once you combine the music with the sound design, because there are points, um, the kind of climax points in the piece, um, the score obviously reaches a climax, but those are then supported by the sound design, which create these kind of great big rumbles. And we, you also, because it's hyper reality, we're using all our senses, you also feel a rumble um, going through your body. So it's kind of, it's, it's really heightening um, those kind of, the kind of extremities of the dynamic range. Um, and that felt really exciting to me to be able to do that and to be able to use, utilize those things. Um, the other thing, apart from the kind of dynamic range, is the use of spatialization. So we can place the sound around in the space um, through the headphones. So as you're walking through, you will hear things that are happening to the left and the right and front behind you. Um, and that, that, again, is something that was creatively very inspiring and something I really wanted to explore because I've never done, I've not done that before. So that was, that was wonderful. I have to say, I can't wait to get in there. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> now, I am sad to say, that's all we've got time for. If you want to find out more about Current Rising and the upcoming performances, then please do visit the Royal Opera House website. But for now, all that's left to do is say thank you to my wonderful guests who joined me here for today's Insight, supported by Rolex. And of course, a huge thank you to you watching around the world. Good night. <laughs>